very good morning all of you professor cna rao professor dr indumari uh, madam mr sanjay rao so faculty colleagues students we are here today for the special lectures by the awardees of national prizes for research in inorganic and physical chemistry uh, for th this year and this is given by professor uh, uh, cnro education foundation cnro education foundation conducts many academic programs like uh, outreach programs and very generously recognizes academician and researchers for their contributions and to also to encourage them i just would like to mention few uh, outreach programs and activities by cnro education foundation national outstanding teachers award science outreach programs these are conducted twice a year at gangotri uttarakhand for students and teachers then science outreach programs these are conducted uh, at school chandan uh, lakshmeshwar at lakshmeshwar then also student mentoring programs so in addition to this they generously instituted several awards as i mentioned to really recognize the academicians and researchers and uh, i just want to go through uh, yeah so the uh, several prizes this is a very unique program which uh, cnro education foundation has instituted you can see that you know each year the field of research is, is different and uh, you know it is recognized and uh, the first one I can, as you can see the chemical education award 2015 the recipient is professor uday maitra from iisc bangalore the next one in 2016 energy materials and devices and the recipients are professor k s narayan ncsr dr k vijay mohan and pillai csir the next one 2017 was interfaces between chemistry and biology the recipients were professor sandeep verma iit kanpur and professor mugesh from iisc bangalore the in 2018 it was solid state and materials chemistry and the first one is myself and the, the dr ak tyagi from brc in 2019 it is a chemical spectroscopy and molecular structure the recipients were professor ilankandan arunan professor amitava patra from iics kolkata in 2020 it was peptides and nucleic acids so the recipients were professor t goindraji from jncsr professor sg srivastan from iser pune so this year we have on inorganic and physical chemistry the recipients are professor kanishka biswas from jncsr professor r vaidyanathan from iser pune okay so you can see that it is very unique that every year you have different areas of recognition and uh, we will move on uh, to the first lecture award lecture given by uh, dr ramnathan uh, vaidyanathan he is an associate professor in the department of chemistry at the indian institute of science education research pune he obtained his ms and in phd uh, from uh, jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research and completed his postdoctoral research at the department of chemistry university of liverpool uk and department of chemistry university of calgary alberta canada he joined iser pune in 2012 dr vaidyanathan has pursued research in frontline areas of gas capture co2 separation and utilization catalysis water splitting charge storage and optics and developing and manipulating porous materials for use in energy and environmental applications dr vaidyanathan is the recipient of many awards and fellowships just mention me a few things and first is the material research society of india medal 2019 he received chemical research society of india medal 2018 and best emerging young scientist was given by the chemical frontiers 2017 in goa so with this introduction i invite dr ramnathan vaidyanathan to uh, vaidyanathan to give his lecture 
Dr. Wagen order. Thank you, Professor Sundaresan, for the kind introduction. And uh, my sincere thanks to Professor Rao. I would like to say there cannot be a happier moment than getting an award in the name of your own teacher. So fantastic for me. And also in this uh, outset, I would like to thank all my teachers uh, who have been great to me. And the JNC has been the temple of my science. And uh, I would like to thank all my teachers from JNC and IASC uh, for what I am today. Uh, with that, I'll start my lecture. Can you all see the slides? Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So let me continue. So the talk of uh, today would be Colet Organic Frameworks, Modular Polymers for Energy Science. So what is cough? I know many of you know about it, but for few who may not know, I will give a brief introduction, and then I will try to convince you why cough for energy applications. So cough are modular crystalline polymeric frameworks. So what you have is uh, monomers, which can be seen as modules, which you can pick and choose based on their geometry, as well as their size and shape. And you can combine them through covalent linking to form a polymeric framework. And if you choose your monomers to be uh, pi stacking in nature, then you can get a pi stacking in the third dimension, giving rise to very ordered pores, which can be in the range of 10 to 70 angstroms, which are fantastic for many chemical manipulations. And another advantage that the covalent organic framework bring, brings is this. So here is the high resolution TEM image of a cough versus graphene. And you can see a lot of similarities between them in terms of texture and also in terms of the fact that they all appear truly nanomaterial. And But there is an additional advantage that cough has over graphene, that is when it comes to functionalizing them. For example, if you want to improve the conductivity as well as metal or uh, guest binding properties of your graphene, you typically introduce hetero atoms like nitrogen. And how it is done is by pyrolysis, where you burn with urea or melamine kind of nitrogen rich molecules, a carbonaceous source, and you will dope nitrogen. But the problem here is the functional groups are going to be very heterogeneous, as, you, as it has been shown here. You can have pyridine, you can have pyrazole, a variety of functional groups, and also they are going to be doped randomly in the uh, where it is doped in the graphene stru structure. Whereas, if you consider cough, you are combining well defined monomers in a stoichiometric ratio, and you are developing a very crystalline product where these functional groups are going to be periodically dispersed and they are going to have very single homogeneous site control. And this makes the cough as an equivalent to graphene. Uh, in some ways, but has more chemical control. And another interesting thing that you can do with a cough is that you can functionalize them with metal ions as complexes. That way you can develop single cycle catalysis or catalysts. And same way you can develop small nanoclusters of very redox active metals inside the cough confinement. And this will also help you expose the facets of the nanocluster, which are not otherwise easy to expose in a capped surfactant based mode. And this makes a cough as excellent porous support for anchoring nanoclusters with high activity. And the third approach can be linking covalently organic uh, functional groups onto the walls of a cough either during synthesis or by post-synthetic manner and then you can use them very efficiently as uh, uh, binding groups for a variety of guests. And this is one important aspect is compared to MOF, coughs typically as we showed you in the previous slide can have sizes in the range of 10 angstrom to 70 angstrom which means even after anchoring such species or decorating the cough in such species still you will have enough porosity left which is very critical for the access of these sites which are active sites now these are the, some of the examples of what are the kind of covalent linkages based on which costs have been developed and these are very important linkages because these are reversible in nature. And this reversibility is very important to the uniform formation of highly crystalline coughs. And our interest is in aldehyde and amine-based coughs, which are imine-linked coughs. And this is because you can develop a wide range of aldehyde library as well as amine library 
in a simple uh, one step or two step reaction that makes it very attractive for functionalizing as well as for developing highly crystalline coughs and the immune linkages are very reversible which is also very important for developing crystalline coughs so what do you mean by modularity so here is what you will get from a google search on modularity so i want a red module in an assembly of white and gray modules i can choose this red module to be there in a very site specific manner or in other parts you can look at modularity as a very complex thing that you can have this uh, unit which is developed by modules of very different shapes and size and for example, this blue could be a hydrophobic unit. The yellow could be a amine-containing unit, very favorable for CO2 binding. The green could be something that controls the polarity of the groups and so on. So you can have different functionality within a single unit if you take this modular approach. And for example, if you introduce a hydrophobic unit, you can see that that becomes advantageous for developing coatings of soft on bulk materials like paper, textiles, and so, so on. And that makes the paper and textiles hydrophobic, which means you have introduced a property which is not inherent or intrinsic to the paper and textiles by using this cough in a very facile manner. You can simply paint this modular uh, developed cough onto a paper or a textile. Same way you can develop hierarchical porosity. You can combine it with very conductive materials like graphene uh, using this modularity so that you make the modules compatible with graphene then you can make composites and very recently even 3d printing inks have been developed by the modular nature of the cough so that it is becoming very highly dispersive in a very thick gelish solvent and that makes it very suited for 3d printing and one of the key things we also would like to point out is the fact that see you can do a two-step uh, control on a cough's property by using this modular nature. So what you do, you use one of the modules to be a functional linker that will not interfere with the cough formation, but stays on the walls of the cough once the cough is formed. Now you can have a linker which is very uh, connected to the, so the, the functional group that is introduced in the cough already, and that can be made to covalently link with it. Thereby, you can introduce a very new functionality into the cough in a post-synthetic manner. And please keep this in mind, because I'll show you how this can be exploited in a, a real chemistry. So our, and our target is cough anodes for fast charging, lightweight metal ion batteries. And we are going to use this concept of modularity to improve the anodic activity of coughs. So one of the key features of cough, another important feature is that coughs can be exfoliated with a very easy procedure compared to graphite, for example, because the pi stackings of coughs are much lighter in the sense they are at a longer distance, which means they can easily be exfoliated. So there are different methods to exfoliate a cough. You can exfoliate it by solvent-assisted sonication, or you can have a, a very smart way of using one of the monomers to be non-pi stacking. Then naturally the pi stacking is weaker. Then even during synthesis, the cough can occur as polymers, which are self-exfoliated, and that is another approach. And then the third approach, which is a more controlled and robust approach, is to chemically introduce functional groups either post-synthetically or during the synthesis, which do not favor pi stacking, but keeps all the aromatic richness of the cough and then forms exfoliation in a very controlled manner. So typically the self-exfoliated ones are thermodynamic products, whereas the solvent exfoliated as well as the chemically exfoliated tend to be more of a as, uh, of a kinetic product, which means they will restack left alone. Okay, so the best method is chemical exfoliation or the self exfoliated methods. Now, we introduce a new concept into this. What we do, if I take a cough, as I told you, if I pre code it with a functional group that is meant to not to interact with the cough's uh, formation, but will just interact when a new small molecule is allowed to in, in form a covalent bond with it. Okay, so I'm introducing such a functional group here and I form the cough. Now the cough is highly pi stacked. Now I make it react with a small molecule which is separately pre-coded with functional groups that are suited for interacting with guests which are going to be introduced later. And it has a tail group that can covalently bind with this already coded functional group in the cough. 
Now, when these two form a covalent bond, the bulkiness of this will exfoliate the cough in a chemical exfoliation fashion, but the exfoliated cough now have this new additional functional groups, which are very suited or tailor-made for interacting with the new guest species. In this case, we are talking of lithium ions as the guest species, which can interact with these three spherical balls, whereas the exfoliating arm is what is this tail. And this, we call it as a concept of functionalizing exfoliated agent. And you can see that it has a lot of similarity to this post-synthetic approach, which, has, which I explained in the previous slide. Now, what is the chemistry? The beauty of the chemistry is shown in this particular aspect. You can take a diene, which is the anthracene in this case, which can be called as module one, and you can pre-code this diene into the cough. And then you can have a dienophile, which in this case is malic anhydride, which I can call as module two. And I'm going to introduce this after the cough forms so that I, I create what is a four plus two addition reaction. And then I get an addict, which has a functional group, which is very favorable for binding with incoming gas. And what I do, I do it on a cough. So I make an anthracene cough by combining with it with a resorcinol trialdehyde. And the anthracene diamine is the unit used here. And in this another cough, I have a phenol trialdehyde instead of that. So this is to compare the impact of anthracene units alone and varying the, uh, the aldehyde groups, how it has an impact. And what is the dienophyte? The malic anhydride. So after the cough is formed in a post-synthetic fashion, I do, I do this 4 plus 2 addition on the anthracene site. And depending on stoichiometrically, stoichiometrically how much malic anhydride I use, I can control how much of this addict formation I can create. And this is very nicely monitored using a UV visible spectroscopy. So this peak at 270 nanometer is a signature of anthracene units. And as I keep adding the malic anhydride and keep the reaction going, you can see the peak is losing the intensity. Whereas the other peaks due to other functionalities in the cough, they do not lose any intensity. So if I call this other groups, intensity as B and the intensity of the anthracene as A, and then I plot it as a function of time, you can see that the reaction is complete in 48 hours that means all the anthracene units have been um, converted into malic anhydride adduct. So I have completed my organic reaction. So it is a very trackable reaction. And you can also see that the TEM clearly shows the thick cough has been exfoliated into very thin layers. How thin? That can be seen from the AFM studies. From the height profiles, you can see that the cough with a thickness of about 200 to 600 nanometers goes down to as thin as one to four nanometer, which corresponds to two to three layers of the cough only in the exfoliated form. And this is easily something that will accommodate only few malic anhydride unit thick layers. And this, this is something we developed in our group where we can track this exfoliation also with powder X-ray diffraction. So the L, uh, sorry, the H00 reflection, which is a characteristic reflection of a cough, starts to lose its intensity because the atoms contributing in the AB plane are now going to contribute less when the material gets exfoliated. And this makes uh, the 00L reflections become more prominent compared to as this intensity of the H00 reflections go down. And also you can see another important signature that there is a new peak occurring at a 2 theta of 17.5, which is not present in the parent cough. And this peak is due to the ordered insertion of the malic anhydride groups into the, into the structure. And also you can follow it from the fact that the porosity systematically drops as the reaction is continued in this case. Uh, but important thing is the pore volume does not change, which is something you would expect because the pore size of the cough, whether you are in exfoliated form or you are having it in the uh, cough form, will have to be the same because they are both polymeric and the pore size remains the same. And then we, we are excited by what we have now and we wanted to see if the exfoli exfoliated form of the cough has any advantageous impact on the anodic characteristics of it as an anion in a lithium ion battery. So we have done the charge discharge studies on the cough versus con, and this is for the cough, and this is for the corresponding con that is generated by a chemical exfoliation. And this is for the next cough, 
and the con corresponding to that. So I would draw your attention to this part of the graph where you can see the specific capacity of the anode derived from this uh, cough based or con based ones and you can see the comparison. So the coughs are giving a specific capacity in the order of 200 milliamp hour per gram whereas for the con it raises to a value as high as four times what the cough is able to give and it goes up to almost 800 milliamp hour per gram. And this indirectly means that what you're having in the con is a very char fast charging battery, whereas the cough will have a very slow charging battery and you can increase the Network is going here. important to see is how much does it fall and we see that the fall is very less for this con and in comparison you can see the graphite which is a commercial graphite which was used in the same setup in our own lab and you can see that the con is losing 22 percent of its capacity whereas the graphite loses 80 percent of its capacity when you grow from a current density of 100 billion per gram to one hour per gram, okay? So that is very important point to keep in mind. And the most important thing, which is a quantifiable value, is the energy density. And you can see the energy density of these corn-based batteries are uh, fantastic uh, compared to even the graphite uh, materials. Uh, uh, sorry, I should be pointing out here. This is the corn-based one. So the graphite is giving 164, and whereas the corn is able to give a very high value here, 220 milliamp hour per gram. And uh, so what is the major advantage of a cough? Another major advantage comes from the fact that it is a crystalline material, which means you can derive a formula for your compound and also you can get structural site quantification. And what you can achieve from this is from a cyclic voltammetry and also from a salt structure, you can calculate the theoretical capacity of your material as to how many lithium ions can it have and from based on that number of lithium ions, how much uh, milliamp hour per gram can it give? And you can compare it with the experimental value and you can see they show excellent match. And also you can assess your materials capacity even in number of, in terms of number of lithium atoms per specific number of functional groups in the unit cell of your cough. And this gives a huge advantage when you want to uh, make a future battery design based on module approach. Okay, and also we showed that we had a very good rate performance and you can see that the impedance spectroscopy allows you to calculate the diffusion coefficient for lithium ion and you can see the cons have three times higher diffusion coefficient compared to the corresponding cough and this explains the improved rate performance and uh, from the electrochemistry as well as the crystallography, we calculate the energy density. I think there was a mistake in the previous slide. So this is the energy density that we can see. And the commercial graphite has an energy density of 320 watt hour per gram, uh, kilogram, whereas the cons have 364 watt hour per kilogram, which is spectacular. And this is possible because of the combination of electrochemistry and crystallography. So we also compare it with all the other type of commercial materials and the corn-based corn battery anodes are pretty good compared to many of them. Even at high current densities, they are able to do pretty well. So in principle, what we have achieved is we have used anthracene-based coughs and carried out deal salted reaction to make it into an exfoliated con using this approach of functionalizing exfoliation agent. And by that, we have introduced additional functional groups to interact with the lithium in addition to the functional groups which are already present in the cough and, and also the exfoliated structure gives the chance of introducing fast rate performance, which means fast charging batteries. So I will sh show another example where this approach of module, module by module construction of a cough gives you superior anode material for sodium ion battery, which is more interesting. 
because electron what we have done is we have tried to introduce electron rich and electron deficient modules into a cough to control the overall electronic character of the cough so i don't want to spend too much time here we all know why sodium ion battery is a very attractive target because of the high relative abundance over lithium which means we can sustain over a long time particularly for a country like india which is peninsula since sodium can be got from ocean it is very important to develop sodium based batteries and also sodium based batteries will increase the weight because lithium is lighter than sodium but at the same time you can use aluminum as the current collector over copper which is much lighter so you can balance the weight uh, what you bring in by sodium by using aluminum as the collect current collector to some extent so that you can keep also the weight in check and then there is a problem two major problems with sodium ion batteries one is that people simply say the larger size of sodium is what is the problem and that is absolutely a problem because the larger size does not let graphite be used as the anode material because what you will have is a volume expansion because of which graphite can give a lot of trouble when you use as an anode but another major problem with the sodium is that thermodynamically the formation of nac6 or nac8 kind of complex uh, i mean compounds during this insertion is not favorable whereas the lithium c6 is much more favorable so you need to create an anode which prevents volume expansion when you use sodium ions as well as you need to find an anode which has a thermodynamic favorability for sodium ion insertion and uh, if you look into literature what are the approaches being used people use hard carbon okay as the anode and combine it with sodium cobaltate this is one of the commercial batteries where uh, what is the problem is you don't have a major attraction for sodium here so it is a little sluggish in how quickly you can sodiate and desodiate and also the number of active sites for sodium is limited because at best you can form sodium c6 or sodium c8 and so the energy density is uh, only limited even theoretically okay and then people have come up with very interesting inorganic anodes like titanium dioxide even can be used but the problem with this is as you insert more and more sodium the structure starts to change and the sodium insertion deinsertion becomes irreversible when the structure changes and also there can be volume expanded structures which again gives the same problem what hard carbon also gives and a very interesting uh, article came from professor mantiram's group where they very nicely explain how you can modulate the homo lumo gap of the anode to match the electrolytes sodium stores and when they match at the interface of the electrolyte and the anode if you can match the homo lumo gap to the electrolytes homo lumo then you will have a very ready insertion of the sodium into your uh, anode and also if the, the gap is uh, very favorable then the anode can accommodate the volume expansion provided it is made out of a flexible material and cough being a flexible material offers you this choice of attending to the volume expansion as well as you can functionally tune it to modulate the homo lumo homo lumo gap thereby better thing so how do we achieve it you, you we use the module 0 which is the trialdehyde uh, which has three oh groups in it and then we are going to now systematically change the module 1 module 2 and module 3 where what is the difference is here it is all carbon here we use a tetracing unit which is more electron withdrawing and then here what we do is we use a tetracing unit along with the pyridyl group in a very systematic manner and this is now an electron rich center this is electron deficient center so you will have a push pull effect going into the structure so thereby you can see how you can alter the homo lumo levels and the structure is very crystalline you can see the saed pattern giving diffraction which is fantastic and it is also seen in the pxrd porosity is kind of similar for all of this because the linkers are of the same size so that is possible and we do here as i told you you have electron deficient centers shown in green you have electron rich centers shown in red and there is a push pull concept and that has been systematically introduced into the cox polymeric framework and then from uv visible spectroscopy using top plates we calculate the homo lumo gap and you can see the homo lumo gap is systematically decreasing as we go from the all carbon to the only tetracing to the tetracing plus pyridine groups and this is also beautifully seen from the cyclic voltammetry where what you see here is the oxidation curve and the reduction curve you can see that the oxidation potential there is no shift in the peaks whereas at the reduction there is a systematic shift as you go from all carbon to the 
tetras in to the tetras in plus pyridine and the shift is in a potentially favorable direction which means as you introduce pyridine plus the tetras in into the thing the lumo gap uh, sorry the lumo levels are decreasing whereas the homo lumo, homo level remains the same and that is what is shown here the homo level is remaining the same but the lumo is decreasing systematically but what is the overall effect you have decreased the homo lumo gap in the pyridyl plus tetracyl compound and this is also shown here very nicely so the cough which has both the tetracyl groups and the pyridyl groups has the lowest lumo level as well as the lowest homo lumo gap so this is modular approach to achieving this now what does this do to the anodic characteristics you can see if i make the cough with this uh, lowest homo lumo gap containing material so at the open circuit potential all the sodium ions will remain at the interface of the electrode and the electrolyte but they will not move into the electrode once i apply a potential what will happen all the sodium ions will rush into this negatively charged cathode uh, sorry anode because now this anode is going to suck all the electrons from the outer circuit and become highly negatively charged which sets up an excellent driving force for the sodium ions to come and sit and also the flexible nature of the cough will afford no volume expansion so it will be very uh, capable of staying the same and lot of sodium ions can be loaded which directly relates to the anodic performance and this is what is shown here as i shown as i told you before because of the crystalline nature of the cough we can calculate how many electrons are loading per unit and we can also calculate how many sodium ions are loading per formula unit uh, in this cough this, which is excellent and here is the charge discharge curves of the sodium ion battery what is important to see is that at a very small potential window of 1 volt to 0.5 you get all the redox activity happening and this is very very important for anodic material because now this helps you calculate the potential window at which you can operate a full cell in a comfortable manner when you combine it with a cathode like sodium cobalt so with that we also show that the rate performance of the highly functionalized uh, sodium uh, sorry pyridyl tetrazin cough is excellent compared to what a, a, a graphite can give and also or a hard carbon can give and also importantly even at a substantial current density of 15 gram you get excellent uh, performance in terms of specific capacity to give you a feel for it your mobile phone charges at a current density of 0.67 ampere per gram so in comparison 15 ampere per gram is a very very high rapid charging discharge so if at this potential if you can get a specific capacity as high as 174 milliamp hour per gram this is simply fantastic and also we show that this specific capacity can be drawn in a number of cycles in 2500 cycles without much of a drop and we also show that when we go from 0.1 ampere gram current amp per gram per current density to 10 amp per gram current density there is only a small drop in current uh, in the overall specific capacity of only 55% which is fantastic and uh, so we think these cores could be excellent materials as anodes for even sodium ion batteries and here is the impedance spectroscopy which shows why the cough is performing very well because the charge transfer resistance drastically decreases i take it from all carbon form to the pyridyl plus tetracyl form and this decrease in charge transfer resistance is exactly what gives rise to a excellent diffusion of sodium ions into the anode developed with this cough and you can see the sigma value is the lowest for the tetracyl pyridyl containing cough so we compared with a lot of other coughs so we stand very tall among coughs and we have compared it with some of the best known materials which is nitrogen sulfur coat graphene kind of compounds so we are not too far away from them you can see at a 10 amp our 10 amp per gram current density we are, we are able to achieve 174 milliamp hour per gram specific capacity and the value for uh, nitrogen sulfur coat doped graphene is 236 milliamp hour per gram so we are not too far away so we believe there is a lot of scope in this class of materials as a sodium anode and that is what we conclude so we have taken the modular approach to control the homo lumo gap of a cough uh, and then we have used such a cough to set up a driving force for sodium ions to load into it under a potential as a uh, anode and then 
we show that this can give rise to excellent rate performance and excellent uh, stability window for uh, anodic material. And with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators. A lot of this work was done in collaboration with Professor Satish Ogle, and the work was done, uh, 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 most of the work was done by Satvik Haldar, one of my students, who is a postdoc at University of Dresden with Stefan Kaskel now, and King Shuk. He also contributed a lot, and he is working in a, his own startup company along with Satish now. And I thank all my collaborators who have helped me big time in this and all the funding agency. And uh, I thank all of you for your kind attention. And I'm very sorry if I slightly overrun my time. And I welcome you all to ISAP Pune at any possible time. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Vaidyanathan, for excellent talk. Normally, this kind of lecture, award lectures do not uh, have uh, you know, question and answer, but we can have one or two questions to cheer up Professor Vaidyanathan and also keep up our time so we can have one or two questions, please. Online, offline, any? Can I ask one question, Professor Sundar? Yes, yes, sorry, please. Sorry, sorry. yes. Hello, Bojanathan. I must congratulate you for this uh, award. I Thank just, you. Uh, very nice presentation. I just have a quick question regarding your tetrazin morph. Yeah. So, there your uh, oxidation reduction cycle, uh, is there any uh, uh, involvement of tetrazin there? Because it's also a moiety which can go back and forth in this sort of redox cycle. So, can you please comment on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, first of all, it is a cough, not a morph. Okay. And uh, of course, tetrazin is involved. That is why in the, uh, in the cough, which has only tetrazin, we are able to quantitatively calculate the number of lithium ions per unit cell. And we clearly see that it is not just the imine groups or not just the keto groups. The tetrazin also comes into play and we are able to count two sodium ions per tetrazin unit and that matches very nicely with the experimentally observed specific system. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We can have one more quick question. Uh, sir, can I ask one question? Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, why then it's very nice talk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, to be honest, like I didn't understand whether it is the advantage of porosity or exfoliation. Okay. And another question is, see, we have porosity when it comes to the bulk material, but when it comes to the electrode, I don't know how, how the porosity acts into that energy storage or something. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very very good question. It's a it's more of a device uh, level question. So yes. we have we have seen that. See, you think of it as a current collector on which you have coated your cough, and now mm -hmm. this coated cough is what is the first surface that the electrolyte is going to see, not anything else. So when you have coated the cough, still you have completely retained all the intrinsic properties of the cough or the con in the coated form, that they don't go away. Because think of it in a molecular level. And the polymeric structure is completely maintained. Because we have done experiments where we have scratched the powder back after the usage of over thousands of cycles, and then we have characterized it. The porosity is intact, the surface area is intact, and the polymeric structure is intact. So this is very, very important. And also, you can take uh, the forms of cough which are dense, which is already pre-made, and you can do the same studies, and you will see the specific capacity is negligible. So that is also another indirect evidence, which very clearly shows you need porosity and surface area, and it is completely retainable even in the electrode. And in fact, all the glassy carbon electrodes we use are porous. So that is it's a good answer for you. Right, so the porosity yes. is an important function, and it is yes. it is an uh, important character for the electrode characteristics. Yes. Does that answer okay. question? Yes, man. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, let's thank once again Professor Vaidyanathan for a nice thank time. Thank you. Thank you. So now I request uh, uh, President Jane C S R Professor G Kulkarni to present the award. Good morning, Professor Rao, Madam Rao. Is, there is some issue with this camera. You shifted now. Yeah, I'm. I'm seeing shaking my head unnecessarily, <laughs> which is not true. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I think let's uh, move on. Uh, 
it's an honor to honor the awardee, Professor Vaidyanathan, uh, the donor CNRO Education Foundation uh, has organized a couple of articles for the honoring uh, uh, process. Uh, you know, since you are not with us here, uh, what they have done interestingly is that the flowers and the fruit basket are being delivered at your door. You know, you will hear the bell ring any time now. And a couple of more articles are here, and I have the pleasure of displaying in case you are able to see this is the shawl which will come to you thank very you. soon and thank also you. a certificate thank you and with it uh, i was told a cash price i have not counted the money though thank you thank so you here is the envelope <laughs> thank you thank you so all this will reach you congratulations again to yeah. my, my sincere thanks to professor rao for choosing me for this great honor and my Big happiness getting it from you, Professor Kulkarni, because you taught me a lot of crystallography, a lot of physical chemistry. I'm so pleased to receive it from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Now you can see, according to this uh, program, Professor Subhi Judge was supposed to um, introduce the next awardee, but because of small uh, medical issue, we could not join. Now I request uh, Professor Isar Murthy to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Professor Sundaresan. Mm -hmm. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kaniska Biswas, who is an associate professor, New Chemistry Unit, Jawaharlal Nehru Centre for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore. Dr. Kaniska Biswas obtained his MSc and PhD from Solid State and Structural Chemistry Unit, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and completed his postdoctoral research at the Department of Chemistry, Northwestern University, USA. He joined JNCISR in 2012. Dr. Kaniska has pursued research in frontline areas of solid state chemistry of metal chalcogenides, thermoelectric materials. 2D layered materials, topological insulators, halide based perovskites, and water purification. Dr. Kaniska is the recipient of many awards and fellowships. Notable among them are the ICSE Material Science Annual Prize, Material Research Society in India 2020, Swarna Jayanti Fellowship by DST in 2019, CRSI Bronze Medal in 2019. Materials Research Society of India Medal in 2017, Young Scientist Wiley Award by International Union of Materials Research Societies in IUMRS ICAM in Japan 2017, Young Scientist Medal from Indian National Science Academy in 2016, Young Scientist Research Award DAE BRNS India in 2015, uh, he is the Invited Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry FRSC and a member of the Indian National Young Academy of Science. So, with this, I request uh, Kaniska to deliver the lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you, Isha, for uh, such a nice introduction. So, uh, before I go to the uh, scientific talk, uh, I uh, thank Professor Rao and Dr. Indumoti Rao for continuous support. Uh, and encouragement throughout my scientific career, starting from my uh, integrated PhD days in uh, IAC and of course here. And I of course thank CNRO Education Foundation uh, uh, for considering myself for this prestigious award. And with this, I move on to the uh, talk. And today I'm going to talk about uh, a, a atom, uh, enhanced atomic ordering leads to ultra high thermoelectric performance, which we propose uh, as a new idea in the field of thermoelectrics and this paper is published in 2021. So I'm going to, I have choose, choose only this paper to, uh, uh, to talk about today. So before I uh, go to the uh, topic, I, I go to the topic, I just uh, tell about the fundamental science behind this thermoelectric, which is uh, uh, nothing but ZT, this thermo, uh, thermoelectric uh, figure of merit, which is purposefully made dimensionless. And the numerator has Schiebeck coefficient S, uh, electrical conductivity sigma and uh, unfortunately or fortunately these two quantity like Shivek and sigma are interrelated by uh, famous Mott equation uh, driven by the carrier concentration. So we cannot control uh, both together very easily. 
and the denominator of the equation is thermal conductivity which is also related to electrical conductivity by uh, famous Weidemann Franz law but the only independent part in the equation is basically this lattice part of the thermal conductivity which is governed by the phonon transport in a solid material so as a chemist uh, rather inorganic solid state chemist uh, we we think this problem uh, slightly different way uh, uh, like uh, we need a material uh, or solid inorganic solid which will have a property of glass which will have low thermal conductivity property of metal which will have a uh, uh, have high electrical conductivity and property of a semiconductor which will have a high shive coefficient so now imagine how to make a material which will have property of glass metal and semiconductor at the same time so that is a chemistry challenge in this field so we are working in this direction uh, uh, for a long time and the more fundamental challenge in this field is basically decoupling of electronic and phonon transport in a solid material so which is basically decoupling of uh, numerator and denominator of the zt so now uh, as a inorganic chemist how we design this problem which are the material to choose uh, uh, to to, uh, to synthesize uh, in this in this field so we take help of periodic table because uh, we we'll, uh, as a chemist we like periodic table so if you see this is a, a chalcogen group uh, and if we fix a metal from metal oxide to sulfide to selenide to telluride, the band gap decreases enormously. And you can uh, understand this decrease in band gap by, uh, uh, by, uh, by this simple molecular orbital diagram where the electron negativity uh, actually decreases from oxygen to tellurium so, so that the atomic orbital shifts up and the, the, the gap between homo and lumo decreases. Now in, in an extended system, basically the band gap decreases. And band gap goes even to 0.2 to 0.3 electron volt in, in metal telluride. So we, we can dope heavily uh, them and uh, have uh, 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 and can achieve like metal like conductivity. At the same time, this heavy metal based tellurides and selenides are consisting of uh, 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 heavier metals. So the lattice vibration slows down and we'll have glass like thermal conductivity. So now uh, we have glass and metal like property can be achieved down the periodic table. So that's why in our lab, we always work on germanium, tin, lead, or bismuth or antimony based sulfide selenide tellurides. Okay, so now uh, uh, this is the ZT versus uh, ER versus temperature plot for the state of art material. So we divide this material in three generation. First generation material has been discovered like uh, 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 around 1990s, where uh, ZT is below one, and ZT uh, remains one to two in in early 2000. But after 2012, ZT crossed the value. Two, and there are few only few material which are actually the third generation material but if you see this plot very carefully the most of the material are lead based so, uh, uh, such as lead telluride or lead selenide or lead sulfide so that's why uh, this field demands uh, lead free high performance material for desired mass, mass market application so we are also working in this dire direction to create lead free material in this field so now uh, i come back to this lattice thermal conductivity uh, which uh, uh, basically carries the heat most of the heat in a solid material so lattice uh, thermal conductivity is nothing but the uh, how phonon carries the heat and phonon is basically quantized lattice vibration and the phonons which carries the heat in a solid material solid tellurides and selenides are having the mean free path or wavelength of one angstrom to 100 nanometer so uh, in order to decrease the thermal conductivity basically we have to block this phonon right uh, and there are uh, two kinds of phonon. One is acoustic phonon, this is related to sound waves, and the optical phonon, when atoms are vibrates in different directions, we can actually track them by either IR spectroscopy or Ramon spectroscopy or Trehard spectroscopy. So let's see how these phonons can be blocked in a solid material. So uh, you know, from 1950s and 60s, actually Russians have uh, worked in this field uh, enormously, and they've shown that by solid solution point defects or grain boundaries, this uh, some of the phonon can be scattered but those are the not, not the important phonons those phonons are having either very short wavelength or very long wavelength but uh, the phonon we need to scatter is basically 1 to 20 nanometer which uh, that for that we need a nano precipitate to be embedded in a solid matrix and in this direction there are several important paper came uh, uh, in, in not only lead telluride also in bismuth telluride this is typically uh, 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 i'm showing here a lattice thermal conductivity versus temperature plot uh, champion material lead to lead, you can see uh, the, the thermal conductivity of the lead to lead can be decreased when you have a solid solution. This is known from 1950s and 60s. 
but uh, uh, starting from 2004 uh, there are a bunch of material discovered which are actually nanostructures and nanostructures can be embedded in a solid bulk matrix of uh, thermoelectric uh, material such as red tilloid and uh, uh, bismuth tilloid uh, which this nanostructure are exactly the same size of the phonon wavelength so it can be uh, scatter phonon heavily and decrease the thermal conductivity and can create high performance thermoelectric material but the challenge remains with the, with this extrinsic nanostructuring that the thermal conductivity decreases heavily, but uh, we see a decrease in the electrical conductivity because uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, mismatch between lattice uh, uh, strains and lattice parameters uh, which uh, scatters the electron on hold and decreases the electrical conductivity. So this is the grand challenge of the field remains for last 10 years in a decade challenge because we are always have a uh, decrease in thermal conductivity but we compromise with the electrical transport, we compromise with the electrical mobility and the electrical conductivity. Now, uh, we want to have simultaneous enhancement of the electronic transport and reduction of thermal conductivity. And in this direction, we are working uh, from 2012 when I joined JNC. And we started working in this class of compound. Uh, uh, we say this is 1562 compound. And this 1562 compound is basically one is nothing but either sodium or copper or silver, uh, five is antimony or bismuth, and six is sulfur or selenium or tellurium. So this generally crystallizes in rock salt structure, which is interpenetrating face centered cubic structure. For example, this compound uh, I'm going to talk today is basically AGSB T2, but uh, we have actually produced two PhD thesis in this class of compound. Uh, and then uh, this this compound AGSB T2 is a very uh, well known compound in thermoelectric and solid state community uh, because of this uh, a complex structure. Because although it has a sodium chloride simple structure, but silver and antimony is disordered in the sodium cation cation position. Okay, and that has been observed by very very uh, different experimental reports. But the paper from Mohanty Group in Michigan State in 2000, uh, this PRL paper in 2007 predicted that this compound can be stabilized in ordered form, like silver and antimony can be ordered. And we are looking for this order structure from 2012 in this class of compound, but we could not find it experimentally. Okay. So, but you can ask me question, why we are looking this ordered structure? Uh, the reason behind is that the disordering can actually tune the electronic transport very heavily. By, by it has an independent control on electronic transport, uh, such as electrical conductivity and Schiebeck coefficient. For example, disordering can create electronic localization uh, by charge, uh, charge scattering, which is proposed by Anderson long time back. And this Anderson metal insulator transition is well known in solid state chemistry and solid state physics. But I can simplify by uh, Anderson localization uh, by, uh, by invoking the concept of mobility here by this simple uh, schematic of uh, semi metallic uh, electronic structure. So, this mobility edge is nothing but uh, is mobility edge actually separates the uh, localized states from the extended states. And EF is the Fermi level, EC is the mobility edge. So, now this localization happens due to this charge carrier uh, uh, scattering in the disordered sites. So, now if EC, this localized states, moves towards the Fermi level, electrical conductivity decreases, and when EC goes below the uh, uh, EF, basically uh, it, the system becomes Anderson insulator. So now, uh, from Mott equation, you can see this is a Mott equation, famous Mott equation where Schiebeck coefficient uh, is basically the first derivative of the density of states. Okay. So now when EC moves towards Fermi level, the parabolic nature distorts and increases the effective mass, which increases the Schiebeck coefficient. So that means if I move the EC towards Fermi level, electrical conductivity decreases at the same time, uh, Schiebeck coefficient increases. So there is a conflicting uh, parameter, a conflicting effect of disordering because disordering actually creates these localized states. So we cannot work in the regime of Anderson localization because we'll, we have to work with an insulator with a high Schiebeck coefficient material, but we want a good electrical conductivity. That's why we need to work in a partial ordering state or rather weak localization regime so that we, we can have a delocalization of the electronic state and 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 we have a good severe uh, coefficient at the same time so in order to do that we worked in this agsb t2 compound and as i told you uh, the puzzle in this compound is disordering of silver and antimony because uh, and silver and antimony both sits in the octahedral position okay and silver is having uh, a different charge uh, compared to antimony as well as size so this is one of the main reason for disordering of this compound so so we we uh, we are looking uh, for, for this class of compound, how to make this cation order, right? So that actually uh, we, we want to make the cation order and play with the delocalization of the electronic states. So that is the main goal. So, you know, so we search periodic table because we know uh, periodic table like our palm in a hand. So basically, 
uh, we we choose this cadmium two plus, which is exactly the average size. If you buy, uh, like uh, add add one 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 five and seventy six and divided by two, it's is basically ninety five ninety six. So we choose cadmium and drop cadmium purposefully in this compound. Let's see what happens. And we have synthesized this compound by uh, uh, vacuum seal tube reaction. That I'm not going to the details of that. So let's see what happened uh, to the powder excess diffraction. In powder excess diffraction is a very high, uh, uh, indicative result we got because generally this AGSB T2 sits in the little bit non-stereosymmetric position in the phase diagram, so it always have a little bit impurity of AG2 T in this sample. As soon as I drop cadmium uh, from two mole percent to six mole percent, impurity goes away. But at the eight mole percent, again uh, second phase uh, comes out of cadmium telluride, so that means the solid solution limit of cadmium in this sample is basically six mole percent. Okay. So now, uh, to see this ordering effect, we have done low temperature electrical resistivity measurement uh, because electrical resistivity shows the upturn. So that means this happens due to the competition uh, between weak localization and uh, disorder enhanced electron electron interaction with the inelastic uh, scattering processes like electron phonon coupling. And if this uh, minima uh, 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 have a value at high temperature, so that means this material is more disordered. For example, this pristine compound AGSB T2 shows the minima at 60 Kelvin. As soon as I drop cadmium, this minima goes to 10 Kelvin. So this cadmium is actually ordering uh, the silver and antimony and uh, low temperature data fits that root 2 dependence that tells that weak localization regime we are working. So actually what uh, we wanted to do, it is happening. Now you remember famous Mott equation, I showed that uh, when uh, Shebeck uh, coefficient, we, we should see an increase if there is a localization because of uh, uh, deviation from the parabolic uh, band structure. So this is a Shebeck coefficient, low temperature Shebeck coefficient of pristine sample, which is a which is having a disordered cation of silver and antimony. But as soon as we drop cadmium, we see a decrease in the Shebeck coefficient. The broad harms goes away. So that means as soon as I drop cadmium, silver and antimony is getting ordered in the system, and the electronic states are getting delocalized. So that's what we wanted. So there is a direct proof from the low temperature transport data, uh, electrical resistivity and she that delocalization of the electronic states is happening with cadmium doping. So then, as usual, we, we talked with Umesh, and Umesh group has uh, showed that conversion energy calculation, and he showed that ordered AGSB T2 is uh, having a, a, a stable structure compared to the disordered uh, uh, AGSB T2 structure. But this ordering, uh, the structure become more stable if I do cadmium. So actually cadmium creating ordering, and we have we have done many uh, calculation to show that actually cadmium sits in the disordered SB, uh, SB position in the mat, uh, in the compound, and this uh, stabilizes the ordered structure. Uh, uh, so so uh, Umesh has uh, shown that our chemical intuition is actually true. So then uh, uh, he showed the electronic structure calculation, and electronic structure of ordered AGSB T2. So, so the semi-metallic structure at zero Kelvin, so that means it has a valence band, uh, nearly uh, flat valence band, and uh, slightly dispersed conduction band, so, uh, so, uh, which, is, uh, which has a pseudo gap at zero Kelvin. So now, please see this band. When we disorder the GSB T2, we see the localization of electronic states. So that, that is actually we proposed by the schematic that we, we should see a localization of the electronic states when you have a disordered AGSB T2. And these localized states are basically nothing but the tellurium P orbital. So now, now let's see what if I do cadmium, what happens? So now this is the uh, disordered AGSB T2, which has a localized flat band. This is a flat non-dispersive band, which, which is which is actually the localized band. As soon as we do cadmium, this localized band goes away. So that means the cadmium actually orders the silver and antimony. And it creates delocalization of electronic states, and also cadmium drops extra hole in the system because cadmium is two plus, antimony is plus three. So actually, it lowers the Fermi level. So basically, cadmium is doing two things: it's delocalizing the electronic state at the same time, it's moving away the Fermi level from the mobility edge. So we are working in a delocalized regime. That's what we want in thermoelectrics. So let's see. This is the detailed carrier concentration and the mobility data measured. Uh, by extensive uh, low temperature uh, PPMS experiments, where we have shown uh, actually the increase in carrier concentration by cadmium doping. That's what we proposed, and we see that. And but uh, although the carrier concentration increases, but mobility does not decrease uh, with cadmium doping because cadmium actually delocalizes the electronic states in in in, uh, in ordered AGSB uh, T2. So now uh, you can ask me question: Can we see by eye this atomic ordering? Actually, yes. So this is the pristine sample. Uh, AGSB T2. Uh, we have done a careful HRSTEM head up imaging in a Titan microscope by collaborating with a collaborator uh, uh, from uh, uh, Shenzhen. 
and he, we we have shown there is a uh, no uh, the, the intensity distribution is uh, exactly similar and uh, electron diffraction shows only the fundamental spots due to the rock salt structure we don't see any superstructure spots let's see when we do cadmium actually we see the intensity distribution so this is the nanostructure domain which is formed by actually cation ordering this is 6% cadmium cadmium drop sample and uh, if, if i can uh, this uh, uh, this thing is visible clearly electron diffraction you can see very very weak uh, half half way spots so that is basically the cell doubling so cadmium is actually doubling the cell in different direction and uh, creating this ordering of the structure which is seen by uh, hrstm head up and this creates the nanostructure domains which are in the size of 2 to 4 nanometer and 2 to 4 nanometer is the size exactly the phonon min 3 bar size of agsbt2 so this can actually scatter the phonon as well so then we have done node experiment, uh, uh, HRTEM experiment, where we see this nanostructure domain forming by cadmium uh, uh, silver and antimony ordering due to the cadmium doping. And here you can see clearly, basically this nanoscale superstructure domain formation by uh, atomic ordering. And you can see uh, by uh, uh, first Fourier transform of this image, basically you can see this halfway spot that is coming from the cell doubling. Okay. So then uh, we have done uh, HRTM experiments in our Titan as well. When it was working and we can we see this nanostructure domain with a period of two to four nanometer which is a very intriguing discovery uh, because it, this size actually the uh, matches size of the mean free part of the phonon in this agsbt2 and you can see there is a spot splitting of the fundamental spot so that means this is a higher order ordering so that happens due to this two to four nanometer domain formation and this domain actually forms by cation ordering, uh, which, which which we see by the cell cell doubling spots. And this is more uh, clear image. This is the inverse MFT image. So now I, I go to the another, another uh, part of the image. Here you can see this electron diffraction. There is a clear superstructure formation of the splitting of fundamental spot in, in fourth direction. So that tells that nanostructure, so higher order nanostructure domain formation. And of course, there is a half a weak spot that tells that this forms this basically cell doubling and which creates this nanostructuring domain. Okay. So then we have done low temperature heat capacity experiment. And this low temperature heat capacity cannot fit by D by model. Okay. So we have to invoke Einstein uh, model and this Einstein model we have to invoke in this Debye model and this Einstein model is nothing but the low energy optical phonons. So this in, in, in this cadmium dope antimony uh, SB, AGSBT2. So that cadmium actually softens the phonon and uh, this is a direct proof of that. And also uh, it scatters the phonon by creating this nanostructure domain formation. Uh, uh, and uh, and also the softens the phonon, so it has two 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 effect and decreases the thermal conductivity of the glass limit. So now uh, this is the total thermoelectric data. This is electrical conductivity. This is the control data AGSBT2. When, when I do cadmium, the six percent the maximum limit of solid solution. The electrical conductivity uh, is high because of the delocalization of the electronic states and the thermal conductivity is low because of the nano domain formation which scatters the phonon also soft, uh, softening of the phonon and with that we get a ZT of 1.5 at uh, near room temperature and 2.6 at high temperature. So let's compare with the whole state of what. So this is the whole state of our data uh, to this date. So basically uh, this is our data in the mid temperature range our data actually outperforms all the material. But we have important data from uh, uh, Kanazi, this group from Chicago, uh, late telluride based material, SNSE from Beijing group, and also Bismarck antimony telluride from Wuhan, and uh, Bismarck antimony telluride from Boston, and we have another data in germanium telluride from Bangalore, as well as uh, Pei group and Shanghai published data on germanium telluride, which has a similar JT, but our average JT is very high compared to them because we can uh, have a low temperature to high temperature, it shows a flat kind of JT, which is actually important for application. So that's why we filed an Indian patent as well as PCT based on that. And then we have constructed a proof of concept device in our lab because our device lab, lab is working now. So the theoretical efficiency is around 15%, but unoptimized device, single leg device shows an efficiency of 9.8%, which is very good. So then we have compared our device data with the state of our single leg de de device. So this material shows around 9.8%. It will be here, somewhere here. But we have a better data from actually uh, this compound. Uh, the germanium antimony telluride, which is an optimized device, which have a data which outperforms the other device data. And by, by seeing this progress, actually Tata still contacted us two years back. And uh, I should mention here, actually this relation with Tata still happened uh, in uh, two ways. The first uh, is basically due to Professor Rao, because uh, Supriyo Sarka visited Professor Rao and he told, uh, uh, like, we can meet Vishwas so that, that I got a connection. Also, uh, I have a, another connection to Tata still through Professor Kulkan, he's sitting here. So, 
they, they because in steam power plant we have a huge amount of different graded of waste heat so can we convert this waste heat to electricity and based on our these patents uh, both in n type and p type material actually after, after uh, two years work we have scaled up the material, tested the thermoelectric property, tested the mechanical stability, and created 36 leg multiple uh, leg device, and which is actually uh, you can buy in the market uh, for a bismuthyl weight base, but for high temperature, we have made this material. And uh, this is going to put now in Tata Steel wastewater line, which is having a low grade uh, waste heat, and uh, they have uh, pre approved our second phase of proposal, uh, which we are uh, going to pursue soon. With that, I conclude. Uh, today I showed like fundamental uh, the discovery in thermoelectrics. We, uh, we uh, generally I want to summarize in one sentence here because the field moves towards basically disordering. Because till now people propose that disordering can increase the thermoelectric figure of made by decreasing the thermal conductivity uh, because the entropy of the system uh, increases and that's why we see uh, low thermal conductivity and high ZT. But we propose totally opposite concept by creating ordering actually. We can delocalize the electronic states, and we have another handle. We can create the nanostructuring, uh, which uh, decreases thermal conductivity and give rise to alta high ZT. I hope that uh, community uh, will appreciate this work. And uh, the demonstrated strategy is basically the general one, because many of the materials have an inherent disorder, so this can be uh, used. And uh, I acknowledge all my students. This, this is a slightly older group, and this is the current group. And I have uh, excellent PhD student, postdocs, as well as master student. And I have excellent collaborators, especially for this work. Umesh for DFT, DFT calculation, Ajay Soni in IIT Mandi for low temperature TDS PPMS measurements. And of course, uh, uh, Jai Ching uh, for a head of STM because uh, we were asked this question. We have to contact him for this experiment during the revision of the paper. And of course, I have different collaborators from different parts of the uh, uh, India for uh, other thermoelectric work. And also the generous funding. Uh, Sonojanti Fellowship, ACRB DST, Tata Steel, Shekshakal Laboratory, and of course my unit uh, seat fund when I join and also uh, still I'm getting support from new chemistry unit, uh, ICMS also and also from JNCSR. Uh, and th th thank you all. Uh, I, I'd be happy to answer any, uh, if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kariska, for a scintillating talk. Uh, for, uh, Professor Kulkarni. Yes. So, <coughs> Kanishka, interesting uh, talk. Yeah. Yes. Thank so you. So, with your uh, cadmium doping, yes. uh, six percent. Six percent. Uh, you are able to achieve domains containing superstructures, doubling of cells and right, right, cell right, parameters. Right. But uh, there are only a small fraction of such domains. Right. Right. So, actually, sir, if you see the, the total material is a bulk material. So now uh, the fraction is very small, but the size is also very small. So we have multiple number of nano precipitates, or not nano precipitates, nanoscale superstructure. We say in the material. So if you see, uh, see uh, like particular TM image, and it's everywhere actually. So in in a particular TM image, it, it you will see the four or five places. So it is there in everywhere in the sample, but the size is very small. Uh, the distribution is high actually throughout the material. So uh, this this happens in nanostructure thermal. Yeah, actually, point is like how do you connect the observed efficiency to superstructures because I think their fraction is very small. Yeah, because you Overall, know, doping is having average effect. Yeah, so six percent doping is not as a small percentage as doping. So generally, doping works in one to one to two more percent. In that this is fine. Yeah, I'm saying about the superstructure. Yeah, yeah. You emphasize that right. superstructure is having uh, influence right. on the property. Right. Yeah. So so basically, sir, superstructure is everywhere in the sample because so this superstructure is forming due to silver and antimony ordering, and that is uh, like uh, basically catalyzed by cadmium. Okay, this is not a cadmium telluride nano precipitates. Yeah, I will discuss. Sure, thank sure. you. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Hello. Yes, Professor Sud. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice talk. Uh, this uh, maybe you answered it when Kulkarni asked. Uh, this cadmium, where is it going? Is it going in the place of antimony and uh, and right. why does it lead to ordering? I didn't follow the mechanism. Yeah. So, so, so there are two. Uh, right now, we have two ways of understanding why. Uh, so, first of all, I will answer your first part of your question. So, actually, cadmium is going to antimony position. So that uh, we have a formation energy calculation. Uh, it it shows in the correct way. But in a chemical way, I can answer you much better because cadmium is doping hole in the system because cadmium is two plus. Silver is plus one. Antimony is plus three. So now, 
if there is a whole producing per cadmium doping, it has to go to antimony position because cadmium is plus three, cadmium is plus two. So each cadmium doping will give you an extra hole. If it goes to silver position, it will give you electron. So, so we have a direct proof from the hole measurement. Cadmium is going to the antimony position. So now, uh, why it is ordering? Because this is this silver antimony telluride is having a rock salt structure, and rock salt structure, the cation position sits in the octahedral position. So silver is having a size of silver plus is one one five picometer, whereas antimony is seventy nine picometer. Antimony plus three. So there, there is a size mismatch as well as charge mismatch. Now cadmium two plus having a size. Exactly average of silver plus and antimony three plus. So that that's why the creates the ordering. So that that is the chemical intuition we have. So later we have we 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 have analyzed in different ways. For like this Ag two T compound, like say silver telluride, the class of superionic compound of silver sulfide, silver selenide, silver telluride. Because Professor Rao also worked on this superionic compound in 1960s and 1970s. So this silver telluride Ag two T. Uh, if you heat up the silver telluride, it forms a rock salt structure at high temperature. Well, although the room temperature is not rock salt. So now, when I uh, have an antimony doping in silver telluride, it forms silver antimony telluride. So antimony actually dopes and creates this rock salt structure where silver and antimony is disordered. So now, uh, cadmium doping lowers further the energy and give this uh, higher order, basically the uh, uh, ordered cubic structure, which is having much lower uh, energy uh, uh, shown by Umesh by DFT calculation. So so uh, that way it happens actually. So how do you get uh, anti? You get cadmium uh, will give you the P type doping. No, right? so no, sir. Actually, cadmium uh, cadmium doping gives P type material because cadmium is plus two, antimony is plus three. So no, no, that's what I said. Material. How do you get N type material to? Right, so N type material in this class, AGSB T two is not known yet, sir. We are working on that. N type material is not known in this. Oh, 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 because yeah. for applications you need to put them together. Yeah. So, so that application, what we do generally, we have P type AGSB T to one side. And with a similar ZT at room temperature, uh, slightly above high temperature, you can use similar like, material which will have a similar mechanical property, such as you can use bismuth telluride or bismuth antimony telluride as an type material. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, basically, yeah. So it's a combination of the two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's having questions. Oh, sir. Uh, this Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Tanishka, fantastic yeah. talk and amazing work. So, thank so you, thank beautifully you. done. Uh, I have one different way to look at this thing. Yeah. So, I looked at your diffraction patterns, particularly the yeah. electron diffraction, right. uh, where you get this supercells, and also you see this uh, four spots right, right around right. the main yeah. spot. Right, right. So, typically, such things also happen. When a structure uh, grows as a twinned crystal lattice, right, twinning, this, you know, yeah. twinning. So, so we have yeah. taken care of this during the electron diffraction, basically. So, so uh, I, 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 we are aware of that uh, crystallography uh, because twinning. You should see the domains also by HRT imaging. So that that we don't see. Okay, because twinning, you, you can see that different polarity domains basically. Mm. Okay, in, in imaging. This, this is uh, like uh, this is well known in electron diffraction and uh, TEM imaging basically. But this okay. structure, this exactly cell doubling uh, spots are happening uh, without twinning. So that means there is a cation ordering. And we have not only this proof, we have electronic transport proof, we have a, a theory calculation proof, we have uh, other experimental proof as well. So we are not based, we are not claiming based on a single experiment basically. We are claiming no, I, yeah. I completely, you have convinced us, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. But my question is arising from yeah. the same route what Professor Kulkarni was saying. Yeah. Because for a six person doping, Right. To get such a uniform uh, ordering exactly. all across the material, right? Because six is a very, cadmium, very right. unlikely situation. See, but right. but a six percent doping can cause a twinning of the crystal in such a way yeah. that you can get this. That's why I asked. Right. So See, I, this this, this kind of nanostructure structure thermoelectric is well established in like last uh, fifteen years, and uh, because and this this, this superstructure domains are uh, actually not so known, but nanostructuring is known. And because of, uh, and this is 600% is quite high. So this, we have earlier published paper and there are several groups in the world with two to three mole percent of different element. It, it forms the nanostructure with the volume percent is uh, quite good to scatter the phonon. Because we, if you have so much volume percent, so so that material will contribute to the thermal conductivity and electronic stuff. So the bulk property will go basically. So what is the typical crystallite size in these cases? A crystallite size of bulk material or nanomaterial? Nanometer, nano, two to five nanometer. So that is the mean prepath of the phonon size. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we will have more questions which we can have it later. So with this one second, we thank that uh, Professor Kanishka's uh, wonderful talk. And uh, now I request the president to honor the three speaker. Yes. On behalf of the CNRO Education Foundation, it is my pleasure to honor the awardee. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni, for felicitating the speaker. Now I request Professor Sundaresan to take over. So next, uh, I would like to request the president to give his remarks now. Bharat Ratna, Professor C N R Rao, Dr. Indumathi Rao, Mr. Sanjay Rao, faculty colleagues, students. On behalf of the center and on my personal behalf, I congratulate both awardees, Professor Vaidhinathan and Professor Kanishka Biswas. Having received the national prizes for research in inorganic and physical chemistry. Congratulations also for your interesting talks. Professor Sundareshan mentioned a couple of points related to Samat. I would just like to reiterate. Most of you are aware Samat was created as an umbrella structure of the material science program for greater efficiency and visibility based on the recommendations of the International Review of Material Science in the year 2017. Samath consists of faculty members from four units, CPMU, ICMS, NCU, and TSU. And among various activities, Samath is also actively organizing this annual uh, symposium. To increase the visibility of Samath activities and to encourage talented chemists, the CNRO Education Foundation, in association with JNCSR, has instituted national prizes for research in chemistry. Since the last five years, several talented chemists were identified to deliver this. Professor Sundaresan already showed the list, and it carries uh, a certificate cash prize uh, donated by the CNRO Education Foundation. On this occasion, on behalf of the center, I would like to thank Professor Rao for his visionary parts in instituting this lecture series, and also for the support which comes from the CNRO Education Foundation. I also thank uh, Madam Rao for her guidance in this event all through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Now, I request Professor CNRO Rao to give his remarks. Okay. Uh, uh, dear Vaidhanathan and Vishwas, wife, wife, and I congratulate you on your success. My, I, I am con confident. With, hello, and many more recognition will follow. Or oh, I feel that there are mountains. To fly to climb, and all that that, that this little recognition not will not be forgotten. May God bless you with love, the, the luck to you. 
I now am thankful for the situation for all the day. Thank you, Professor Al, for your nice and kind words. Now, now we have vote of thanks by Professor Isra Murthy. Thank you, Professor Murthy. On behalf of Samad, I would like to thank CNR Education Foundation. The foundation acclaimed for promoting teaching and research activities by presenting the national prizes for research in inorganic and physical chemistry to the two young accomplished researchers in this field in India. Congratulations to prize winners for your wonderful achievements. We would also like to place an Records our sincere thanks to the founders of the CNR Rao Education Foundation, Professor CNR Rao, Madam Indumadi Rao, and Mr. Sanjay Rao, for their vision and wisdom in instituting this foundation to support such academic activities. Our sincere thanks to Professor Kulkarni, President JNCISR, for his generous support in organizing this event. Professor Rao and Mr. Sindhumadi Rao wish to thank the president for felicitating the national prize awardees with a token of appreciation present him with his stone may i request to professor sundaresan to present this stone Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the honor. So, we appreciate and thank the speakers for the invigorating prize lectures. We thank the admin for the logistical support. We also acknowledge the members of the hall management for coordinating this online event without any hitches or glitches. Finally, I would like to thank all the online and offline participants who have enthusiastically joined and adored this occasion. Thank you all once again. One last event is remaining. Uh, uh, you know, it's my pleasure to honor uh, Professor Sundaresan on behalf of the uh, CMO Education Foundation. Thank Professor Sundaresan. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Sanjay. So, thank you, thank thank you very you. much. And uh, we have a tea in the conference dining hall. Please join us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.